constant. It's an unchanging God. My situation may change. My circumstances may change. But God remain a faithful God. That I can learn to trust him. Even when I don't understand the way things are and why things are happening to me the way they are happening. That does not change the integrity and the faithfulness of your God. We see some few examples in the Bible. Because to judge a man faithful, you cannot judge God's faithfulness, faithfulness based on where you are right now. You must look back to where he's brought you from, what he's done before. If God did it yesterday, that same God is still on the throne and he's not going to do it again. But what about those who have never seen the move and the power of God? There were some three Hebrew boys in the book of Daniel called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They never saw or experienced the faithfulness of God. Their faith was based on second-hand information from their fathers and the fathers before them that told them about the faithfulness of God who delivered them from the land of bondage and slavery and how God came true for them. And they heard about the story of a man, a young boy called David who with a, a slingshot and a stone through the help of this God took down a giant called Goliath. All they had was a testament like you and I had. But it was enough for them. And they held on to that faithfulness of God and they judged God faithful based on his word. Because it's not a man to lie, neither is it a son of man to change his mind. They judged God based on the integrity of his word. And so when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were taken into slavery, and God did not come true for them, because the natural thing is, if I'm serving God, if I'm faithful to God, if I'm committed to God, if I'm giving my all to God, then nothing bad should happen to me. Is that not the story they tell us every day? Amen. <laughs> is it not? Because the reason why you are sick is because you don't have faith. How many times have you heard that? The reason why you didn't get that job is because you didn't pray enough. The reason why that, that, that your wife left you is because you were not fasting and praying when you should be praying. But what if you've done everything? You've fasted, you've prayed, you have been faithful, serving God. There is no charge against you. And it still happened. So how do we explain that? How do you explain to a righteous man that the reason why you're going through the trials and tribulation is because you're serving God too much? Maybe. <laughs> we should find good excuse. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell into that category. They were faithfully serving God, but that did not exempt them from crisis. Now, fast forward a little bit. Now, if God did not save me from slavery, I should begin to question the integrity of that God. And now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are confronted with a life and death situation. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says in the book of Daniel chapter 3, verse 8, I love the translations. They said, O king, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. They were confronted with a life and death situation. And they said to the king, even if God does not come true for us in this present situation, we still judge him faithful. Even if God refuses, that's what they're saying, be it 
But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy God, nor worship the golden image thou hast set up. They said in verse, uh, the, the verse before that, they said, we are not careful. They said, God is able to save us. But even if he does not save us, we will not bow to you. If God does not heal me, he's still God. If God does not answer this prayer and bring this person back to life, he is still God. Even now. What are you going through right now that is causing you to question the integrity of your God? Is there sickness in your body? Is it your financial situation? Is it a job loss? Is it your children? Is it your marriage? That the promise of God is yet to come true in your life. And the enemy is telling you God is not worthy of your worship anymore. Mary, in the New Testament, another Mary, different from Mary and Martha, I believe, in John chapter 20, Jesus, one of, I love me, stories, women in the Bible they don't stop to intrigue me. The women of faith in the scriptures. Listen to me, women of God. Beautiful women sitting before me. Listen, you guys are blessed. You are powerful. If you know, the reason why the enemy is after you the way he does is because he knows that if he allows you one little space, you will wreck his kingdom. He knows. You are the greatest threat to the kingdom of darkness, women of God. Check through the scriptures. In this story in John chapter 20, when all the disciples, all the mighty men that followed Jesus, when Jesus was arrested, they ran and they were hiding. Amen. It was this woman that stood up and went to confront the confronter or the enemy. And she went to the tomb of Jesus, not minding that there were soldiers and guards there. She went there. But that is not the story this morning. But when she got there, she found out that the body was no longer in the tomb. She did not know that Jesus has risen from the dead. But this woman, even in death, she still judged God faithful. How do I know? And she went to the tomb, read the story, and she was still saying, where have you kept my Lord? In that, Jesus was still her Lord. If the one that I'm looking up to has been defeated, so to speak, I should run away. But not so, that woman. She judged God faithful, even in that dark situation in her life. What is the darkness in your life this morning? King David, another critical scriptural example this morning. In 2 Samuel chapter 20, uh, 12, you know the story, if you're familiar with the story, David did something wrong, took somebody's wife, and killed the man. And the wife became pregnant for him. You know the story. And she conceived. And the child was born. And while the child, when the child was delivered, he became sick. And David began to pray. And began to cry out to God to spare the life of that child. But not so. The child died. You prayed. Lord, save my marriage. Save my marriage. Save my marriage. Yet, you have to sign the divorce paper. Lord, save my child. Save this child. Yet, you are now staring at the casket. 
what will your response be even then? And the Bible said, this is the premise of our communion this morning. And this is the scripture we're going to stand upon to take our communion this morning. But when David saw that his servants whispered and perceived that the child was dead, therefore David said unto his servant, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth, washed himself, anointed himself, changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped the Lord. How can you do that, David? You should be angry, bitter, cynical against God. Look at how God put you to shame. You are a man after God's own heart. You have prayed and declared the promises of God that say you will not die but live to declare the works of the Lord in the land of the living. You have declared the word of God that said none shall cast their young. You have declared the words of the Lord that the Lord will bless your food and your water and take sickness away from among you. You have declared and stood upon the word of the Lord that says, you sh with long life will the Lord satisfy you and show you his salvation. Yet, your child died. And you still had the audacity to go and worship that same God that just let you down. How can you do that, David? How can you judge him faithful even when your prayers went unanswered? The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 13, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promise. We don't read text like this anymore in church. They didn't receive the promise. It was not that God did not promise them. This was not a make-believe. God put a seal of approval and said, I promise you life and not death. That promise still stands. It has not changed. But the Bible says they did not receive the promise but having seen it from afar, and we're persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth here. Even, even now simply means, you know, it's the same word that we use in describing something that say is an even surface. Right? When something is even, that means there is no break, there is no disorder, it's straight. And that is what they are saying, that I may be broken in the midst of my brokenness and my crookedness. God is still straight, dependable, reliable. There is nothing irregular about God. There is no shadow of turning in God. There is no in, God is dependable. God is not a man to lie, neither is he the son of man to change his mind. He is the Lord God, he changed not. Even in my, oh help me Jesus. I don't know how uneven. And as I think about this, I, want to share something. It's personal, but I, and I feel in my heart to help you understand, because sometimes we go through stuff, and I know maybe there are people here who've gone through the same thing, and maybe there's somebody here who is going through the same situation in a different way, and the enemy is trying to tell you that God is not worthy of your praise anymore. That is a lie from the pit of hell. And I remember years ago, two incidents in my life the first time that I cried like an animal, then I was not saved. The second time, and all has to do with my late mother, biological mom. And then the second time was this, the true life story. 
my, one of my younger brothers who is now late, who passed on a few years ago now. And he was one of the most intelligent brothers that we have of all my mother's nine children, I believe. He was smart, smart as they come. And this boy was so blessed fine boy and handsome and smart, intelligent, everything. He's just a whole package and had everything going on for him. And just to fast forward a little bit, and he got a scholarship to go to school in, uh, in Poland. And he got there. The whole story is still muddled up. We don't know what happened. But about a year or a year and a half or so to, to his program or to his studies there, something happened to him and he completely lost his mind. And, and I began to find out later what really happened. And now my mother was called and informed to go and pick my younger brother because I wasn't at home. Uh, then I was in the Bible college. And so she had to travel for about 10 hours to go to the airport there to go pick my brother. Now, nobody told her what was wrong with my late brother. She didn't know. She just thought she was going there to just go pick and embrace her son. And when she got there, she said bye-bye. She saw a sane, healthy child off. Now she is receiving a mentally sick, violent son. There was nobody with her. My father was not there, who is late now, who knew about it. Never told her. And just this woman, I don't know how she managed that she was able to. Can you imagine the torture? And I remember when I saw my mom with my brother in the hospital, I wept and I cried. And I said, God, where are you? My mother has aged, and that's, I believe that one of the things that really killed her. She just dropped one day and she was no more. And I had to stop what I was doing and go join her. We took my younger brother to school, uh, to the hospital one day. And on our way back, uh, looking at my brother and looking at my mom, my heart was just bleeding. And I remember crying. And I met a friend who was offering me an option. And I said, God, I almost took it. And I remember coming home to the house where we were that night. I'm just trying to cut a long story short because of time. And I began to pray. And as I was praying in anger, in pain, in agony of soul, because this was a life and death situation confronting us. And I began to sing. I will serve no foreign God or any other treasure. You are my heart desire, Holy Spirit without measure. Unto your name I will bring my sacrifice. And I said, Lord, you can kill them. But I'm not going to turn my back on you. It was not an easy decision. I said, they can go. But for me to compromise the faithfulness of God on the altar of this, I'm not going to do it. I said it now to you in summary. That decision did not come overnight. It was a struggle in my spirit. Thank you, son. Listen to me, child of God. My younger brother later died. 
My mom died of a destitution. And I remember, you know, fast forward, and I, 1996, 1997, I began to, was praying, and the Lord gave me a word that the year coming was God is going to wipe away my tears. Listen to me now. Brother, I began to feel better. And I'm talking to you somebody this morning to encourage you. Because what is more important to you and to me, even now in your state of despair and destitution, this is just a temporal abode. Eternity is everlasting. And I remember saying to myself from the book of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we printed a sticker in our church then in Zaria, my mouth will boast over my enemies. And I said, this is the year that God is going to restore everything to me. This is the year that the Lord is going to wipe away my tears and my shame and the reproach that has plagued my family for too long. And I was excited about that year, getting into that year. And a few weeks into that year, I got a call. My mother was just not sick. I spoke to her a night before. And the next day, 12 hours later, she slumped and she died. It's a true life story. And when I heard that she's gone, the first thing that came to me, and I believe that was the enemy, said, okay, now boast, let me see. Let me hear you boast. You say you will boast over me. Now your mother died at such a tender age. Now boast, let me see. And I picked up myself in the agony of my soul and my spirit. And I say, yes, my mouth will still boast. In the Lord, my God, I will make my boast. Because death is not a final. The Bible says, oh, death, where is your sting? That that happened does not change the faithfulness of God. You must come to understand, as a child of God, as a Christian, born again, spirit-filled, that what God is preparing you for is not just for here. Eternity is the main goal. Everything is just in a, we are in a phase and it's passing by. So the Bible says in the book of Hebrew, it says people who say such things, it says they are looking for a better city. There is a city that is better and more beautiful than Grand Cash. There is a mountain that is more beautiful than the mountains of Grand Cash. And that is what God is preparing us for. Are we ready for that? The reason why you are broken hearted, the reason why you cannot bless God even now is because everything about you and me starts and stops here. When we talk about Christianity today, we talk about God blessing us with a big house. There is nothing wrong with that. A new truck, there is nothing wrong with that. Listen to me. The truck you bought six months ago is already old. You know that. Because uh, 2019 is already out. Amen. <laughs> You know, I got this truck. I got this truck last year. My head was like, I was big now. And I'm looking every day and they're showing there's something new. And I was like, please. Everything is passing away. Are we, can you, that you are in pain right now does not change the integrity and the faithfulness of God. That is my point to you this morning. That things has not happened for you yet. 
And I dare to say to you as a pastor who is such, I'm very bold, I know that. I believe unto death. I believe in the faithfulness of God. I believe in the power of the word of God. I believe that God is able to do abundantly above all that you and I can ever think or imagine. I believe with every breath in me that God is all powerful, is all knowing, is all doing. But in the midst of that belief, what if God, not the devil now, God does not come true for me when I want him to? Does that make him a liar? Why do I wear my long face every day? It's because I didn't get what I want. Amen. We are all, we, we say our children are spoiled, that we live in a spoiled generation. You know what we say today about this generation? And that they are all spoiled and, uh, and there's no hard work. They're whiny. They want their way. Child of God, you and I, these Christians of today, we are worse than the children. Amen. We are worse than them. We are worse than our children that we complain about. And I say, oh, if they don't get their way, they begin to throw tantrum. Watch a Christian, watch a pastor. Amen. And you realize that uh, <laughs> monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> if I pray now for you and I say, God showed me that he has healed you and that that healing doesn't happen and the person, they come back today and tell you, oh, that person you just prayed for just had a heart attack. And I start going back and began to whine. God, why will you disgrace me? I get angry because we think it's all about us. There is more to this kingdom race than money in the bank. There is more to what God is preparing us for. And God wants you to know that he loves you. He's going to give you. The Bible says it is the Father's good pleasure to give to you. But what if he does not happen yet? Are you going to keep whining? Like my little boy Judah. So. <laughs> the whines. We had a long face. Because I said no. When God says no, you know, the whole house becomes toxic. Huh? When God says no, you that used to volunteer in the church, you stop coming to church. You don't come to church no more. Why? Because I prayed to God and, and God didn't. And I hear people say, I'm angry with God. It's okay to be angry with God. It's okay to say, oh, I'm not going to come to church no more. I came to church and I've been giving my money. I've kept paying my tithes and I gave everything I have to God. And do you know that after last week, I, saw, I gave everything I had to God and now my company just went bankrupt. I'm not doing that no more. You were not given to God, you were given to feed your ego. Amen. Listen, the faithfulness of God is not dependent on his performance. Now say that to you again. The faithfulness of God is not dependent on his performance. God is not faithful because of what he does or doesn't do. God is faithful because of who he is. <laughs> and so if you judge God based on his performance, you'll be of all men most miserable. The faithfulness of God is not based on his performance. It is based on his love and the character and integrity of who he is. And for you and me to know that love and to know God to that depth, it comes by revelation. It's the love of God that is shed abroad in our heart that frees us from undue expectation. As we pray this morning, you tell people, your, your husband, you love them unconditionally. 
I don't know if you love your husband unconditionally this morning. Don't raise your hand. I don't want no trouble this morning. Amen. <laughs> I'm not, you, you love your wife and you love your husband unconditionally. That's what I want to believe. And if you can tell me why you love your wife, you don't love them. Because love has no definition. You don't really know why you love them but they are your world. Amen. They are not the prettiest person around. They are not the, the tallest. They are not the most handsome. They are not the richest. But you just narrow your gaze and you say, this is the one I want to die with. Amen. So come rain, come sun, come high water, you sink and swim with that person. Whether they give or they don't give you, you just love them. And now, when you give to your husband or to your wife, you don't give in expectation of anything. You give because you love them. You just, you enjoy giving. You don't, you're not expecting any reward. You don't expect love. You, it, love is not based on the reward. It's based on your emotional satisfaction that you get. You get fulfillment from making the one you love happy. Amen. Let me not go there. This morning, even now, God is still able to bring back to life that dead situation. Even now, God is still able to turn your story around. And he will. But if he does not, Sometimes it's not everything that is the devil's problem. Amen. It's not everything that is happening to you and me that is being caused by the devil. Amen. So, so we should stop giving him undue credit and undue attention. We glorify the devil too much. He's not as powerful as we make him to be. Whatever God allows, God takes responsibility for it. He is a faithful God. He will never leave you nor forsake you. I want to stop here this morning. I want us to read two scriptures. And we will pray and we'll be out of here. Hebrew chapter 11. From verse 11. I want to read that and then we'll read uh, of, uh, Second Samuel chapter 12 and we will take our communion on that and we will pray and we will be out of our way. Listen to this. True faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, many as the stars of the skies in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promise. They died in faith. They died believing. They died trusting. They died trusting God, they, dry, they died believing that God was going to show up, and he never did. But they still died with their faith. They didn't stop going to church. They didn't stop praying. They didn't stop worshiping. Even when the promise did not come true. They didn't become whiny babies like you and me. Amen. <laughs> we'll stop whining. Amen. Verse 13, all this, this all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them from afar off. And we are persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth here. For they that say such things declare plainly. I love this verse 14. They declare plainly that they are seeking a country. And truly, if they have been mindful of what of that country from hence they came out from, they would have the opportunity to return. That is to say, when the trials and the tribulation get too hard, we have the opportunity to backslide. We have the opportunity to turn our back on God. And some actually do that, but this one say no. But now 
because we desire a better country that is an heavenly one. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. They are not ashamed to identify with this God that is not able to give to them. And I remember years ago again as we pray, uh, as a young Bible school student and uh, young Christians, and I used to ask people this question, why do you love God? Why are you a Christian? And they would say, because God healed me, and there is nothing wrong with that, and because God saved me. And they have good stories to say, which is all wonderful and nice and true and beautiful. And I will always turn around and ask them this question. I say, okay, what if God did not do that? And then you see a pause. Would you still be here if God had not healed you? If God had not given you that, would you still love him? Would you still love your father who is not able to give you? Would you still love your father if he was an invalid and bedridden? If he's not a strong God, would you still love him? But God is not that. He's all powerful. He's all strong. But there's something to ponder about this morning. Verse 39, as we pray. And this all having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. How can you have a good report and yet you didn't get the promise? Shall we stand up this morning? <clears throat> Second Samuel chapter twelve from verse eighteen. I, if you just forgive me, can you just sit down for a second? Can the ushers come and help me? Sorry, because I, I want us to get this before we we'll stand up together. Thank you. Can we put this on here yeah. also? Yeah, perfect. As you receive your communion, just wait and we'll take it together. We'll pray. You can just pass it around while I read. I just want you to listen as we pray. Uh, verse 18 of Second Psalm chapter 12 this morning. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we we'll speak unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that a child is dead? But when David saw that a servant whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth, washed himself, anointed himself, and changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord, and worshipped. Then he came into, and he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Amen. In the midst of pain, he ate. Amen. You know, sometimes when we are when we are mourning and grieving, the last thing we want to do is to eat. Amen. You know, when we are mourning, when we are grieving, uh, when we are in despair, we lost all desire and taste for food. But God is saying it is time. And so this communion is about strength. And it's trying to let the enemy know that yet we will praise the name of the Lord. Even now I will worship my God. 
Even now, I will lift up my countenance. I will anoint myself with oil because I know that he is a faithful God. He may not come when I want him or how I want him. It may not happen for me the way I expect it to happen, but I count him and I judge God faithful because he is the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is a covenant-keeping God. What he says he will do, he will do. He may not happen when I want it or how I want him, but I know he's a faithful God. And I know that he will never leave me nor forsake me. Even in death, he is still my God. Even in pain, he is still my God. Even in sickness, he is still my God. Even in prosperity, he is still my God. Nothing can change the faithfulness of God in me because I have proved him to be true and he's compassionate. And I know that even though you are going through a trial this morning, that does not negate the truth, not even a fact, that God still loves you and cares for you. He loves you and he loves me. He's mindful of you. Your pain is his pain. The Bible says in all our affliction, he was afflicted as one. He grieves for you. He cries for you. God loves you. Don't let the enemy tell you otherwise. Your situation is not, is not new to God. There is nothing you're going through that is strange to God. There is no temptation that has caught up with you that is uncommon or common to men. The Bible says, with every temptation, God shall make a way of escape. We serve a God that is compassionate. He is faithful. Sometimes his compassion, we can't understand why. I don't know why God will let a child die after a man has fasted and prayed. I don't have answers to that. My theology is not up to that. So for me to explain that, I do not know. I don't know why. God will promise me something and yet he didn't come true on it. I don't know why. I can't explain it. And I will not deceive you in trying to find a theological answer to the mysteries and the ways of God. But one thing I do know is that he's a faithful God. He's dependable and he's trustworthy. My theology knows that. I know that to be true. I know that. That he loves me is undeniable. Shall we stand up this morning? Thank you, Jesus. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what your even now is. Even now, are you going through? Is it a medical situation? Is it your health? Is it your marriage? Is it your finances? I don't know what your crossroads is this morning, child of God. I don't know what you're struggling with this morning. I don't know what has taken away sleep from you. But God wants to give you strength. I want you to talk to God briefly this morning on your own. And say, God, even now, in this chaos, in this darkness, in this mess, you are still God. Sarah judged him faithful in the midst of barrenness. God came true later. And I dare to tell you, child of God, with all confidence in the God that I serve, that your case is not going to end up in shame. It's not going to end up in death. It's not going to end up in defeat. God is going to change your story like he did for Sarah. But you need to trust him this morning and talk to him and say, Lord, I trust you. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I trust you. Precious Lord, your body was broken so that our bodies will be mended. Lord, every broken heart, every broken life, every broken relationship, every broken financial situation in this house this morning, 
Father God, this is your broken body that came to replace our brokenness. The body of Christ broken for your mending. Take it in remembrance of that victory. The blood of the new covenant in Christ Jesus. The voice of the blood that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. May the blood of Jesus speak hope into your heart where there is discouragement this morning. May the blood of Jesus speak healing into your body where there is sickness this morning. May the blood of Jesus speak lifting for you where there is disappointment this morning. May the voice of the blood speak direction for you where there is confusion in your life this morning. May the blood of Jesus bring clarity to your future where there is anxiety and fear this morning in the name of Jesus. We overcome by the blood. Whatever has stood in pride and arrogance in your life that says you will not lift up your voice anymore to sing of the goodness of the Lord. May the voice of the blood remove every obstacle in your life in the name of Jesus. May hope be restored into your heart by the voice of God's encouragement this morning. Child of God, it is not over yet. God will not leave you the way you are. The God that I serve is mindful of your situation. And if you are here this morning and you want to say, Jesus, I want you to wash me. Only the sick need a doctor. The blood of Jesus also washes away our sin. May every guilt in your heart be washed away. Are you carrying the guilt of something you have done in the past? By the reason of this communion this morning, there is going to be a washing and a release for you into the new life that God has given you. And you can also say, Jesus, I want to serve you for the rest of my life. You can say that and God will honor that this morning. Take the blood of victory that was shed for you. Father, we give you praise. I speak hope. I speak eternal hope to every family represented here. I speak eternal restoration to every soul here this morning. I speak eternal joy in Christ Jesus to every family represented here. Whatever has had you bound, I declare you free from every oppression and the opposition of the devil in the name of Jesus. The same God that has turned around my captivity, not once, not twice. May that same God show up in your difficult moment and wipe away shame and reproach from 